Welcome back, everyone, as we pick up where we left off with part two of our look at the latest episode of Checkmate Lincolnites from Adam Shea Films. This is Is the Civil War. Is Civil War history being rewritten? Tremendous response to episode one yesterday, so thank you for all that. Thank you for all the great comments, even those of you who disagreed with me. Everything was done well and done uh, in, in a great tone and with uh, mutual respect, and we can learn from each other and disagree and kind of debate these issues in a way that I think is productive and helps us to understand things a little bit better. So let's go ahead and pick up right where we left off. We're kind of in the middle of a thought. If you did not see part one of my reaction, there's a link in the description, as well as links to many of my reactions to his other content as well definitely check out the channel uh well researched even if i don't always agree with his methods or even with some of his conclusions uh, i definitely respect that he has taken the time to put this all together and he's done a great job with it so highly recommend you check out the channel let's dive in the lost cause had its iconography the battle flag was as sacred and ubiquitous as the crucifix and as monuments started springing up all over the South in the 1880s and 90s, graven images of Confederate saints were imbued with special significance as altars and gathering places. And he makes a great point there, and I know that this is an ongoing topic of discussion today, is uh, what to do with a lot of these monuments, and, and lately a lot of these statues have been getting taken down, and there's a lot of debate about are we destroying history, or, you know, are we missing opportunities to explain these things and it is important for us to understand that many of these statues did go up during a time when they were trying to reinforce this lost cause mythology they were trying to establish white supremacy that doesn't mean they were all put up for that reason but it is important to note that many of them were wartime artifacts took on the quality of medieval relics and veterans organizations were encouraged to guard official Confederate documentation, as one united daughter of the Confederacy put it, as zealously as the children of Israel did the Ark of the Covenant. Hmm. Lost cause histories were literally referred to as catechisms. You can still find one on the Sons of Confederate Veterans website. So, ex-Confederate... Let me go back, because I saw the author of that, by Lion Gardner Tyler. That is the son of President John Tyler, assuming it's the same guy, son or grandson. Um, interesting. Yeah, I'm guessing that's probably the president's son in that case. You can still find one on the Sons of Confederate Veterans website. So ex-Confederates were a little extra in their commemorations of the war. So what? Still seems pretty innocuous to me. Not so much. There was always a political dimension to lost cause ceremonies, and political advocacy was an important function of veterans groups, mainly in support of segregationist policies designed to continue white rule in the South. Politicians frequently spoke at Confederate reunions, and as the decades wore on, different political movements claiming the heritage of lost cause cultural memory made veterans events their soapbox. In the 19th century, it was anti-reconstructionists and populists, in the 20th, Wilsonian Democrats and civil rights era reactionaries. This continues today in lost cause spaces online, where pro-Confederate blogs, Facebook groups, and subreddits fear monger about cancel culture just as much as they celebrate Civil War history. Now, here's one thing I will say about all of that. He's not wrong about any of that. Um, I get really cautious about sometimes the comparisons we make and about demonizing ideas just because they're espoused by radical people. Uh, so, for example, um, let's say that I announce tomorrow that I love Mountain Dew Zero, which I do. I love Mountain Dew Zero. And then next week, some pro-Confederate sympathizing group says they love Mountain Dew Zero. The caution that we have to take here is that immediately there will be opponents of me, for example, in this scenario, who say, see, he likes Mountain Dew Zero. He's a Confederate sympathizer because they like Mountain Dew Zero. So we've got to be cautious because just because, for example, a group rails against cancel culture doesn't mean that railing against cancel culture is a racist Confederate ideology. 
be- just because people who support that also think that. I hope I'm getting this across. Um, you know, j- just because two groups of people support an idea or oppose an idea does not mean that they are equal to each other. And that works on both sides of an issue. Those websites show sure love you. Oh yeah, big fans. In the late 19th century, a major goal of the lost cause religion was to institutionalize itself. Early Pendleton, Jones, and others were keenly aware that passing their ideas down to the next generation would be crucial to preserving the Confederate legacy. So they focused their advocacy on the education system. Mm -hmm. Now that the United Confederate Veterans and United Daughters of the Confederacy were established and active, Lost Cause Evangelists had an organizational network to spread their ideas. Young women of the pre-war planter class, finding themselves in need of income after the abolition of slavery, gravitated toward teaching, and by the 1890s dominated primary school education. Reverend Jones and Susan Pendleton Lee, who was William Pendleton's daughter, both authored popular textbooks in the 1890s advancing the Lost Cause mythos, and Jones urged his fellow ex-Confederates to fight tooth and nail against the introduction of northern authored textbooks into southern classrooms. Yeah, all, all true. Um, that's not unique, I don't think, to the Lost Cause. There are many times in many places in history, in many nations, where that sort of thing happened. Um, and it happened in the North, too. I mean, there's certain, uh, and I don't mean necessarily just about the Civil War, but there are certain things, think about it, certain things that we grew up learning in school that are very different than how they're taught even today, uh, a few generations later. Um, absolutely true, and that definitely had a big role in keeping that lost cause myth alive for future generations. Can't argue with any of that. We should demand the abolition of Yankee school histories from our school. And if they force the issue, we should squarely meet it and fight for a change in our school authorities if they persist in using Yankee school histories. Ex-Confederates' mission to indoctrinate the rising generation was a resounding success. By the turn of the 20th century, the culture war was won, and the impact of that victory was soon felt all around the country. In 1896, post-war racial issues came to a head with the Supreme Court ruling Plessy v. Ferguson, which of course established separate but equal as a law of the land. And it's interesting to note, too, that Homer Plessy, the guy at the center of that case, was only one-eighth black, but by the racial laws of the day in the South, uh, and if you think that sounds a little bit like what the Germans were doing in the 1930s, it absolutely was, and it definitely inspired some of that, some of their same rules about how they determined who was Jewish and who wasn't. Same kind of stuff going on. Homer Plessy was one-eighth black. By that standard, my father would have been considered black because my father's about one-eighth black. I have a great-great-grandmother who was born into slavery. Um, so, you know, that just... It, I, I'm about as white as you can get. I mean, there, you know, so uh, it goes to show you just how big a deal this was in the South and how important it was for them to have racial purity uh, to a lot of people. Now, again, don't lump all Southerners in together, but these, this is how a lot of them felt. White Southerners accepted legal segregation to be an effective substitute for slavery as a tool to control the black underclass. Yep. When the Spanish-American War and World War I gave the reunited states a new sense of national purpose, white Northerners grew more inclined toward reconciliation, and many came to accept the Lost Cause version of Civil War history. Essentially, to reunite white America, Northerners sacrificed the rights and dignity of black America. I would... I would temper that statement by saying some Northerners. I think that's true for some. I don't think that was true for all. Just like during the Civil War, some Northerners owned slaves. Some were abolitionists. Most were probably in the middle where they didn't really have a strong opinion one way or another. Some would have been white supremacists. Uh, you know, so you just have to always be careful not to lump an entire group of people into a statement. But I get what he's saying. Blacks had fought and died for the Union and were instrumental in quelling the rebellion. Yep. But the Jim Crow era saw the Confederate vision of a white supremacist nation rise from the grave. Hell, the federal government even retired the hated blue uniform. In the trenches of the Western Front, Northern and Southern soldier alike wore khaki. But that was and I don't think that's because of reconciliation. I think that was just common sense. Wasn't the reason behind that decision. Most military switched to khaki uniforms around the turn of the 20th century. You should know this. 
Still a hell of a metaphor though, ain't it? I'm still skeptical that everybody would just go along with this. Well, in the 20th century, the Lost Cause had a lot of help from the most effective propaganda tool in human history. The movies. D.W. Griffith's infamous 1915 blockbuster, The Birth of a Nation, and the classic 1939 historical epic, Gone with the Wind. Which I've still never seen. You know, Margaret Mitchell wrote Gone with the Wind, definitely from a Lost Cause perspective. I've never seen the movie. Both reflected and cemented white supremacist interpretations of Civil War history in American culture. By the and to this day, Gone with the Wind, one of the biggest Hollywood blockbusters of all time. So yeah, a lot of influence there. When Julius Howell was interviewed in the 1940s, the Lost Cause was firmly established in the popular imagination of a deeply segregated America. But then, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, things changed. The Civil Rights Movement was a major blow to white supremacy in America. And as people of color gained more social and political agency, historians began to focus more on black perspectives in American history. Yeah. The story that emerged from this research was a continuous struggle against authoritarianism and bigotry that resonated with Americans of the Vietnam era. In contrast, the lost cause came increasingly to be seen as a hateful and oppressive ideology. Yeah, and you know, I think, as I'm thinking back to what he's been talking about with how things are taught in the North and things like that, ha having grown up here in Ohio, so obviously grew up with a very Northern perspective, um, I think it might not even be so much the influence of the lost cause directly that, it, that the lost cause ideas were taught, but I do think there was some influence in terms of how little the aftermath of the war gets taught. Um, I don't know if it's any different now, but man, I didn't, I didn't learn much about reconstruction in high school or in college. And I was a history major in college. We didn't talk about reconstruction all that much, uh, a little bit, but not nearly enough. And I think it's one of the most consequential times in our history, especially for how it set the stage for what came for the next hundred years leading right up into the civil rights movement. Uh, so maybe ignoring, uh, what happened in the aftermath of the Civil War is as complicit as the direct impact of lost cause mythology in the South. And mainstream historiography started to seriously question its legitimacy. The cat was out of the bag. In the 80s and 90s, historians like Gary Gallagher, James McPherson, Gaines Foster, and others thoroughly dismantled the tenets of the lost cause with some excellent scholarship. But there remained a serious disconnect between this growing academic consensus on one hand and the perception of the public at large on the other. The 1990 Ken Burns documentary The Civil War and the 1993 Ron Maxwell film Gettysburg spawned a huge surge of public interest in the Civil mm -hmm. War, but they also propagated common misconceptions with origins in the lost cause myth. The Burns documentary's over-reliance on narration by Southern novelist Shelby Foote left many viewers with a mistaken impression of the causes of secession. I don't think I'll go that far. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. I don't agree with that. And the overwrought sentimentality and sanitized violence of Maxwell's film glorified the war and the soldiers who fought in it. Yeah, but you know what? You could say the same thing about sanitized violence and glory. Um, yeah, Gettysburg, yeah, did it sanitize the violence? Sure, but that didn't, I don't think, favor one side more than the other. Um, and, and glory's got a little bit of that violence, but it doesn't have a lot of it either. Um, I don't know. It also Stretched downplayed the importance of slavery to the Confederate cause. Gettysburg inspired thousands of people to become Civil War reenactors, and to this day, at public events, many reenactors will teach a version of Civil War history more inspired by the movie than by actual evidence. Are you about to shit on gods and generals again? Just one more time, please, and then I'll be done forever. You really can't help yourself, can you? The Lost Cause regained even more ground in 2003 with Gods and Generals, Maxwell's prequel to Gettysburg. This film wholeheartedly endorses the most counterfactual aspects of the Lost Cause myth and has done enormous damage to public understanding of the Civil War. Heavily based on late 19th century Lost Cause histories, the film has become a banner for white supremacists and neo-Confederates to rally under. And I've already addressed all his Gods and Generals stuff, so I won't respond to that again. A powerful 21st century expression of the Lost Cause religion. Great movie. The South was right. But then came the 2010s and the dawn of a new and wide-ranging social justice movement. 
Police brutality against black Americans in particular proved to be a major flashpoint for lingering racial issues. This new movement is complex and contentious, and since it's ongoing, it's difficult to make categorical statements. But one thing we seem to be in the midst of is an attempt to break down systemic inequality in the government and economy, which has led to a far more critical historiography of the eras of American history when those systems were established. The growing interest in black history seems to be inversely proportional to the lost cause's staying power. As more and more Americans renounce the Confederacy for the slavers' rebellion that it was, those still cleaving to the lost cause religion have become more culturally isolated, mm. their ceremonies, rituals, and catechisms increasingly esoteric and irrelevant. Over the past decade, the lost cause has taken a severe beating, maybe even a fatal one. And a tiny part of that has been this show. Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? But you are unfit to lick the boots of the Confederate heroes you defame. You dare insult General Lee? General Jackson? Well, let me tell you something, Billy. You will never compare to the man that Thomas Jackson was, for you will <coughs> never be remembered or mentioned 160 years after your death with all your videos. Probably not. If this show is remembered, I would guess it would be as a small footnote of Civil War history's intersection with 21st century internet culture. If we're fortunate enough to have any legacy at all, I fully expect Checkmate Lincolnites to be considered an imperfect product of its time, like all written or filmed history. I I'll give him a lot of credit there. That was a very sober and pretty accurate observation on the importance of things. Um, and and I, I, listen, I, I've been pretty critical of him at times in these videos, even though I would say overall amongst all his videos, I probably agree with him 85% of the time. Uh, and I've been, I've strongly disagreed with him and I, I don't like his methods at times, but he's just a different personality than me with a different viewpoint than me. And that's fine. We, we approach things differently. Um, but I give him a lot of credit. I think what he's doing is important. I think he sees something that needs to be corrected and he's going about it in his own way and doing that. And, and he's using um, a great deal of skill in doing so, so I give him a lot of credit for that. I hope we're remembered as a nail in the coffin of the lost cause, but who knows? Only time will tell. But there's one prediction that I am reasonably certain about. If things keep going the way they're going, the lost cause is doomed. The myth is like a frail, diseased, very racist old man drawing rattling breaths from a life support system. Can't we just go ahead and Pull the plug. Nineteen eighty four. Oh my God. 1984. The cultural Marxists and the radical left are seeking to erase the truth of Civil War history. I will always stand for the truth, no matter how unpopular it may be. You're projecting. The evangelists of the lost cause rewrote history in the late 19th century. Now their work is finally being undone. We're finally course correcting away from all their madness and their baggage, and you can't fucking handle it. You're not even. He's making a good point there. This isn't so much a revision of history as a correcting of history. So, good point. You're pretending to be objective anymore. You reveal yourself oh boy, where are we going for what with you've this? always been a biased, moralizing, Yankee soul boy! God damn it, Johnny! You never give me the benefit of the doubt. Most people think you're a fucking racist scum of the earth because you fly this fucking flag. You think I'm the bad guy? No. I'm coddling you like the big fucking baby you are, trying to gently coax you into the 21st century before the people behind me fucking drag you there. People think you are a fucking joke, Johnny. You've been discredited time and again your monuments are coming down. Your staunchest advocates are doddering old fools, and pretty soon, they're gonna be in the fucking ground! What? What have we been doing all this time? Have I been talking to a brick wall? Jesus! Looks like a New Orleans cemetery. Where is this going? Uh, uh. 
Now, again, there's where I'll take some exception. You know, the I get it. He's making caricatures of things, but the Chick Fil A shirt, come on. <laughs> Samedi, Loa of the dead, and the keeper of cemeteries. My lord, with all due respect, I'm uncomfortable with this voodoo ritual. It doesn't feel very Christian to me. Fear not, my patriotic friend. You have but a small part to play in it. What do I need to do? Die. of the Southland. The time for your vengeance has come. Rise up and claim your destiny. Rise up! Rise up! Rise up! <laughs> Stonewall Jackson's arm. To be concluded. So there's only one more episode of Checkmate Lincolnites. All right, so that was interesting and very well done, very cool, and showing off his kind of directing chops and uh, things like that. So that was pretty neat. But um, all right, I'm going to wrap it up right there. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. As I mentioned before, you can check out some of my other reactions to the Checkmate Lincolnites series. If you would, uh, consider subscribing. If you're brand new to the channel and you think I've earned it, check out some of my original content as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.